This is Tom Nelson, and I'm happy to have Steve Malloy here on the other end. And Steve, could you go ahead and just introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm Steve Malloy. I publish JunkScience.com. That's what I'm most well known for. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at JunkScience. I've been working on environmental issues for about, for more than 30 years. Uh, I've got a background in science and statistics. I'm a lawyer. I was on the Trump EPA transition team, and I have been trying to cause problems for environmentalists for a long time. There's a lot of lying going on, and I've spent my life trying to, to fix it. Okay. Was there ever a time back in your distant past where you believed in the climate scam yourself? Because I did for, at, for a while. No, I had okay. the good fortune of coming into this whole environmental area, not really knowing anything about it. Okay. And the first thing I ever did, I was working on, this is a regulatory issue. General Motors was the client. The Department of Interior wanted to charge General Motors with something called natural resource damages, one GM to pay tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars for polluting the air. And what the way they were going to figure out how much money GM was going to pay was the Department of air, Interior took a survey asking people, well, how much would you pay for cleaner air? And it, it was obviously just a, a bogus survey. People didn't really have to pay. They're just pulling numbers out of their rear end. And so that was kind of my introduction to how all this stuff is made up. And there's a lot of lying going on. Okay. So, and I just, I, I was very lucky. My first job, I had a lot of exposure to a lot of different issues. And there was a lot of lying in all of this. Okay. I was just fascinated by it. And do you have any sense to, as to what percent of these people know that they're lying versus they just have not checked it out and they, they think they're telling the truth when they are lying? Any idea? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess there are some really dumb people that don't know they're lying, yeah. but a lot of the guys that are, are very prominent, I mean, I, I can only say that they have the internet too, and yes. they can verify our claims or debunk them just the same as we could do to them, but they tend not to. Mm -hmm. And there's, they never try to debate you as that's the last thing they want to do. Mm -hmm. They're more apt to just block you because they don't want to hear from you. And they certainly don't want their audience to hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, the strongest weapon they have really is just trying to ignore you. And if they can't do that, then they will try to shout you down, but they will never respond to you. A lot of politicians these days are saying there's a climate crisis. They actually believe the weather is getting worse and it's threatening to kill us. I don't know. Yeah, well, what what is the crisis? I mean, I yeah. know that you have asked that question. Yes, many times. I asked that question. Lots yeah. of people ask that question. What is the crisis? And you can't get an explanation. I mean, bad weather can be a crisis, but it's not a climate crisis. We've always had bad weather. We're always going to have bad weather in the future. It's pretty easy to debunk this stuff in real time. There's no, there's no trend in increasing disasters. Things do happen. Things always will happen. And the other side, they, they jump on this all the time. And I mean, it just immediately becomes part of the climate narrative. Today, you know, apparently big news in climate world is this flooding mm -hmm. in, in Pakistan. Yeah. And of course, it can only be caused by, by global warming, even though it's in reading all this stuff, you find that there's actually research showing that precipitation there in, in, in monsoon season, these monsoon prone countries has actually been declining for 50 some odd years. And so this is not climate, this is just bad weather. But, you know, the narrative is bad weather is climate. So it's all kind of crazy. You mentioned Pakistan. I just saw that this morning where they're saying, oh, for sure, the Pakistan flooding is caused by climate change. Yeah. Just back in June, they were saying, oh, for sure, the Pakistan drought is caused by climate change. Well, right. I mean, it's totally crazy. They got themselves in a situation where drought is climate, too much Monsoons are, are climate, too hot is climate, too cold is climate. Everything is climate. Nothing is weather anymore. And, and we know historically that there's been lots of weather. Every heat wave is climate. And the whole thing is, is just, there's, there's, no, there's, there, there's no fact or science or anything behind this, but they've, they've got the whole chorus, the whole climate chorus singing it. So, I mean, it's just, it's kind of a large effort to shout the rest of us down. And I don't really think it's working because public polls showing people's concern about climate, really, they haven't changed. And now that we're in the 
energy crisis, inflationary environment, and there's lots of other stuff going wrong. The New York Times can only find that 1% of voters are interested in climate. So I don't know what they think they're accomplishing, but I don't think it's much. Okay. What do you think is happening with this uh, IRA then in terms of the climate spending? I don't know if it's $269 billion or whatever that number was. I just saw that part of that is for parking lots. How much of that is actually going for climate scam stuff and yeah. how much is going yeah. for Yeah. Yeah. So the Inflation Reduction Act, which is not going to reduce inflation, it has got $369 billion to spend over the next 10 years on wind, solar, environmental justice, and other corruption. And this is, I just think of this as Solyndra writ large. Solyndra was the $500 million solar firm that went bust during Obama that Biden was Biden likes to take credit for getting the money for. There was just corruption. And so I think we're going to see $369 billion worth of corruption over the next 10 years and all this wind, solar, EV, environmental justice stuff. 10 years from now, emissions will be greater than they are today. The world will be more reliant on fossil fuels, but we will have ta U.S. taxpayers will have been ripped off and, and U.S. electricity users will have been ripped off to the tune of $369 billion and more. So I don't think it's going to accomplish anything except just fatten the wallets of the corrupt. I'm going to spend the next 10 years pointing out one bit of corruption after the next. And I, it's a sad way to have to spend your life, but it's kind of what I do. So, okay. <laughs> so what is your take on the Supreme Court on the ruling that CO2 is not a pollutant anymore? Yeah. So... Well, you're talking about West Virginia versus the EPA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I worked in the coal industry and, and I was in the room when that lawsuit was initiated and it was started in 2015 and it was finally resolved in 2022 and Supreme Court ruled that the Obama administration lacked congressional authority to do the so-called clean power program. And of course... That, that's the right ruling. Unfortunately, it came seven years after the clean power plan was put into action. And there are lots of coal miners that lost really high paying jobs. Their communities suffered, supporting businesses suffered, states lost revenue from severance taxes. All these harms were caused by this illegal ruling, essentially. And where do these people go to recoup their losses? Well, they can't go anywhere. And so they're just, they're just out. And the evil bureaucrats that pushed this stuff and knew that there was no congressional authorization for it, they're, they're scot-free. As a matter of fact, they're back in power now. They're in the Barton Biden White House and they're working on new ways to screw people. They're looking, they're, they're looking at new at ways to circumvent West Virginia EPA. And in fact, they tried to circumvent it in the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, these people are really evil. They don't care about the consequences of their actions. They have an agenda that is the most important thing to them. They don't really care about the welfare of... And with coal miners, we're talking about a lot of people who are union members and even a coal miners union sort of mindlessly, because they're Democrats, mindlessly go, go along with the Biden administration to the detriment of their members who are hardworking guys whose job, you can't replace these jobs in places like West Virginia. There's nothing else to do. You can open a mine and keep it going for 30 years, employ people during their whole careers. That doesn't happen with windmills, wind farms, and solar farms. You build these things once and then the workers move on. It's transitory work and mm -hmm. you, know, you don't make high coal wages. So the whole thing has been a disaster. I find it very disturbing that our government is just so inhumane when it comes to these these poor people. Didn't Biden just say that they should learn to code? Wasn't that an actual quote? I think it was. So, somebody said that it might have been Hillary. Or oh, was it? Okay. Maybe, maybe it was Biden. I don't no. know. I mean, that, that's a fairly old line. Yeah, they yeah. need to learn to code. Well, not everybody wants to. That's just kind of a crazy thing to say. We need the energy. We burn coal because... It's one of the most efficient ways to produce the energy we need to keep our society going. Right, right. Jumping around here a little bit, have you followed at all what's going on in Canada with the the climate police, the armed climate police with a, a compound and all this stuff? There's been reporting by Kean Bexty on that, I believe. 
Right. I saw something about that. I think that's in Winnipeg where they're they're building yeah. some sort of compound for I, I'm not I'm not exactly clear on it. I think they were going to it's they they were they were building interrogation rooms. I, mean, I think so. Yeah. What are they gonna do? Arrest us and then torture us to do what? I don't know. Confess. I really don't understand the psychology behind this climate idiocy. I mean, these people are really extremists. I mean, they're very scary. Everything they want to do. There's nothing they want to do that's going to improve your life or make you wealthier or make you freer. Everything they want to do is going to degrade your standard of living uh, if they're not just threatening your freedom. When Bernie Sanders was running for president, he wanted to put climate skeptics in jail. He wanted to bring them to justice, his words. Amazing. I mean, have you followed what's going on in the Netherlands with the whole nitrogen thing, cracking down on nitrogen and trying to get rid of one third of the cattle? Pretty amazing over there, too. Well, yeah. So yes. in the Netherlands, they want to reduce emissions in agriculture. And one of the ways they want to do that is to cut fertilizer use because fertilizer, nitrous oxide, I guess, can go into the atmosphere. And it's a, it's a minor greenhouse gas. It's not changing the weather. It's like the rest of the greenhouse gases. Not really. We can't, we can't tell it's changing the weather. But what we do know is that fertilizer helps us feed the world. Right. And Anti fertilizer activism. Well, we can see what happened in Sri, Sri Lanka. Yeah, they, yeah. they started banning fertilizer in 2018, and now it's, it's been a disaster and caused the fall of the government. Look, we're going to have 8 billion people on this planet by November, and the only way to feed them is with fertilizer. And then we can see we're having problems because of the Ukraine war. Ukraine can't export food. And of course, Russia not only has, might have problems exporting food, but because of the economic sanctions, they can't, we can't get fertilizer for them. So there's been a decline in fertilizer. Fertilizer prices are up. Food prices are up. I just, there's no such thing as low emissions fertilizer. Fertilizer is what it is. Some places in the world, fertilizer is overused, which leads to some environmental problems. But generally speaking, we need fertilizers to feed ourselves. And if you're going to start banning fertilizer, there's no substitute for fertilizer. Right, right. Do you blame the it's ESG, right? Is it environmental, social, and governance? Sri Lanka was going for a very high ESG score, and maybe that's yeah. one reason why they went to organic fertilizer. Is that a yeah. true story from your point of view, that ESG is a reason for the problems they're having in Sri Lanka? I don't know exactly. I find it hard to believe anyone is investing in Sri Lanka based on the ESG score. Okay. But ESG scores are something to worry about. I mean, this is... ESG is this leftist scheme to circumvent democratic processes, to impose extra legal standards on businesses, and you can't get them through through the democratic process. So they're going to try to impose them through this Michael Bloomberg constructed mm -hmm. constructed cartel of banks and investment firm. And it's not just climate, of course. The the that's the E part that. The E part is basically net zero. They want to force companies to net zero, but then there's the yeah. S part, which can be funding abortions and okay. uh, the governance, making sure that boards have the right number of women and minorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I focus most, I, well, I focus on the E part, which is net zero. And this whole net zero thing is crazy because there are everything we do in our, on our planet, everything humans do. Depends on fossil fuels. You can't you can't build a wind farm, a solar farm, a nuclear plant, a dam. You can't do anything without fossil fuels. And the notion that we're going to get to zero, there's just no technology for that. There's no plan to go from where we are today to zero by any date. It's just not going to happen. Yet an incredible number of people with an incredible amount of money are pushing for this, uh, and it just it just can't be done. And we're we're never going to get to net zero, but there's going to be a lot of pain caused on the way. Getting back to Sri Lanka, what do you think the major motivation was for them to, they banned chemical fertilizers, didn't they? And that caused a huge problem with their crop yields. Why did they do that? Well, was that a global well, warming I, thing or no? I don't know what the backstory yeah. is. I don't think you can dispute the fact that, you know, agriculture benefits from fertilizer. You, you can only imagine that some really ignorant people yeah. made this decision that we don't need fertilizer anymore. And... Sri Lanka has paid the price. Of course, environmentalists have a long history of suppressing the third world ever since they tried to get DDT banned. DDT was killing 
millions of Africans, and black and brown people around the world. And they tried to ban DDT regardless of the public health consequences. And I, there's, there's a book that came out in 1992 it's called Malaria Capers. And it's about the war against DDT. And the, the attitude described in the book for these anti-T people towards the Africans was they're better off dead than riotously reproducing. So it's kind of sick and twisted. Wow. Oh, what are your opinions on what is going on with the energy supply in Europe? Like, let's start with even the UK. Do you think that they're going to have a ton of problems keeping warm and keeping the lights on? Because they've actually blown up some of their coal-fired stations. Yeah. They literally blew yeah. up. Well, so I think the background for this goes back to the, the birth of climate idiocy and then the Kyoto Protocol. And so since the Kyoto Protocol, Europe has been aggressively dismantling its coal plants, gas plants in, in, in favor of wind and solar. And once again, it, none of that could be, really be done. Germany in particular has spent close to a trillion dollars on this since the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, Germany is a disaster. The UK, uh, they have gotten rid of their coal plants. If they use coal, they have to basically import it from the Netherlands. None of this. And so they've all gotten themselves dependent on natural gas. And natural gas is a fine fuel uh, unless you become dependent on it. Because and, and what they've done, they've become dependent on it from Russia, which is really foolish. I mean, you know, I, I don't recall ever thinking Putin was a sane guy or not a, a, not a totalitarian who, who has his own you know, totalitarian agenda. And so we've seen all of Europe just making itself more vulnerable to Putin over the past 20 years uh, because of climate idiocy, right? That really is the root cause of all of this, getting rid of your own coal and natural gas, shutting down your coal mines, UK coal mines, German coal mines, shutting down your coal plants, more wind and solar, which don't really work. Then we get along, come into 2021, all of a sudden the wind slows down a little bit, starts to send natural gas prices up. And then Putin invades Ukraine and the West wants to sanction Putin. So he threatens the gas, gas flows and gas prices are through the roof and they're going to be through the roof now for the foreseeable future. I mean, what is, I, I don't know when the mess in Ukraine is ever going to end. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. And Putin is, is, I guess he's hoping that he can really squeeze Europe this winter. This is going to be a lot needier mm -hmm. winter. So there's a better than even chance of it being cold okay. in Europe. I read today that in France, they're having a problem with their nuclear fleet. France is 75% nuclear okay. and makes ha, you know has so much power that it can export to Europe. But in the winter, it has to import power. And it imports it from Germany, which is in the middle of a power crisis. It's a disaster that is shaped up to happen this year in the winter. And it's all because of climate. Okay. Now, do you think that disaster is coming to the U.S. anytime soon? Or I don't have a feel for that myself. Well, I, I, I think we're kind of seeing the beginning of it. I mean, California, the Midwest, Texas. I mean, we saw Texas when the windmills froze. Yeah. Several hundred people died. Okay. So that, that, that's pretty dire, I think, in 21st century America. California, if there's a heat wave and, and people turn on their air conditioners, California has been warning against, well, they've had rolling blackouts and they've been warning people against charging their EVs. And of course, that's quite ironic because California just passed a law saying that by 2030, only, only new EVs will be allowed to be sold in the state. Well, California is dismantling its grid. How is it going to charge these things? And EVs require much more electricity than air conditioning. We are looking at disaster because unfortunately, we, we have this left Left-wing governments in the states, which have adopted climate idiocy, and they have infiltrated all the way through the public service commissions. And so people will just, I, I think everyone is just assuming everything is just going to work out somehow. Mm -hmm. And magically, wind and solar are going to be able to power our society. And no one's really thinking any of this through. There's no engineer that is like standing, stepping up to say, stuff is physically not going to work. Battery technology is nowhere near being ready. If it is, it's going to be unaffordable. It's just very expensive. We, we had the wrong people making these crucial decisions when it comes to energy. And do you think Gavin Newsom, it just, he's just hoping that wind and solar is going to charge all these cars. It's, everything's going to be fine when they get rid of them. 
a gasoline powered car? Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what he's hoping. I know that. I mean, I'm I'm sure that he's doing this to burnish his green credential 24 presidential run. At best, he's hoping. I mean, how would he know? California is having these rolling blackout issues now. Um, if they have even more wind and solar and less fossil fuels, what's going to happen? I just don't see how it works. I mean, there's no magic technology on the horizon. Do you have any opinion on the uh, food processing plant fires? It's kind of unrelated to this. No, I haven't really been following yeah. that. I've heard about that issue, but yeah. I, I don't know what to make of that. Okay. All right. And any ideas on what's going to happen in the U.S. election in 2022 in terms of more sanity in terms of our energy supply? Will that affect it much? Well, I'm, I'm hoping at the very least that Republicans can take control of the House and yeah. so okay. we can stop these ridiculous laws. What's going to happen to the Senate? I don't know. I, I'm concerned because Mitch McConnell doesn't like some of the candidates. I'm also concerned that in something like the Senate, the election could be rigged like it was in, in 2020. However you slice it, that election was stolen, and I'm concerned it's going to happen again. Um, there's no way that the Democrats have anything to run on except high gas prices, high energy prices, inflation, no border. And it's just a host of issues. Yeah. All these people should be throwing that on their ear. Somehow they can hold on to the Senate. I mean, it can't, it, that can't happen with that massive collusion, massive cheating. But even if Republicans take over, let's just say Republicans take over Congress, they're probably not going to do it in enough numbers to just override whatever Biden wants to do, right? I mean, just you, you need more votes than like bare majorities. And I know that Biden EPA right now is gearing up to pursue the climate agenda through, through regulatory agencies like the EPA and the Department of Interior. So we're going to need to get rid of Democrats from the White House to stop that. And that's not going to be till 2025. Okay. Do you have any opinions on if Trump can get back in there in 2025 or DeSantis in terms of uh, some sort of a climate skeptic in the White House? Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping one of those two can yeah. do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think DeSantis has learned a lot from Trump. And yeah. He's copied a lot from Trump. He might be, I don't want to say he's less controversial, but, you know, maybe he would handle things. I mean, one of those two has got to do it. And, and uh, I, can't, I don't predict the future. It's one of the... Yeah. Differences between me and people in climate, they think they can see the weather a hundred years out. I, mean, I don't do that. I don't predict it. I can, we, we need to find somebody that is smart enough that once they become president, knows how to fix the problems. And Trump did a great job. He was, he knew what the problems were. He didn't have very good personnel decision picks in a lot of key jobs. And so a lot of things didn't get done or did get done as well as they could have. And that includes at, at EPA, but I'm hoping that he has learned and DeSantis has learned and the rest of the Republicans have learned. I mean, they, we, we can all see how the government has been twisted and distorted by the other side. And it's, it's going to take, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be ugly, but it's good. And it's going to take a real leader to start fixing this. Okay. It's, uh, DeSantis strikes me as a guy who's too smart to actually believe in the climate scam. I haven't seen any quotes from him recently eh, where he was pro-climate scam in, in any way. I don't know if you've seen yeah. it. Yeah, I, I haven't seen people have told me he could be a little light on climate. Okay. I, I don't know that. I mean, uh, it, it, it's hard to say. All Republicans today pretty much slamming Biden for not drilling for more oil and gas. Yeah. But a lot of those same Republicans are also kind of light on climate. It's really frustrating. They used to try to dodge the issue by saying stuff like, well, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> and of course, that, that doesn't stop like anybody on the left. I mean, Al Gore, right, right. don't stop him or Joe Biden, don't stop any of them from mm -hmm. pontificating. I don't know why it would stop Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so for folks on the right and, and Republicans, climate has always been the environment. Generally, it's always been this throwaway issue. They don't really care. They're, they want to say, oh, I'm for, the, I'm for a clean environment mm -hmm. like somebody isn't, right? I mean, you have to say that. And, and, and I can understand why. I mean, the environment is... It's a complex issue. You've got science, economics, politics. You've got history. You've got all these different air pollution, water pollution, waste disposal, pests, all these other different. It's, it's a lot. I mean, I, I, I've spent 30 years, more than 30 years working on this, and so I feel comfortable with it. But most people, most people don't. I can understand that. 
it, it just seems to me that if you're going to talk about the, it, it, that politicians should know something and unfortunately not enough know enough. So it's one of the great frustrations of, you know, my experience. Doesn't it seem like some politicians, maybe not nationally recognized, but some Republican politicians are actually willing to use the word hoax or even scam? I think there are a few. There's no question about that. And it, it's odd because I think a lot of just the base would use the term hoax and scam much more than their elected officials. But you know, the politicians should learn to use those words because it's true. I thought when I started doing this in 1990, the environment was clean. Mm -hmm. It's gotten marginally cleaner since then. Nothing significant, really. But yet there has been all this hysteria over the last 32 years. And I find I, I, don't, I, I can't think of a single example where an environmental group or an environmental activist has ever said anything that was true. This is all just a pack of lies. The air was definitely uglier in the, in the 50s and 60s. And then in the 1970s, we started cleaning it up. And by 1990, I think it's as clean as now. I mean, we have made some marginal reductions in like particulate matter and ozone, but none of it really significant, none of it making a difference. And I think it's it's important to for people to understand that even in the 50s and 60s, air quality was not a public health issue. It's an aesthetic issue. Yeah, the air is dirty, unpleasant to breathe, but it wasn't a public health issue. It wasn't killing anybody. And it, it's quite ironic that as the air has gotten cleaner, EPA launched this particulate matter hysteria. As the air is getting cleaner, EPA is claiming that particulate matter is killing more and more people. And now we've gotten to the point where EPA is saying that even even making making air cleaner will cause more deaths. I mean, the whole thing is just insane. And we're at a point where EPA wants to be able to say anything and do anything when it comes to air quality and no one, no one can complain about it. And so, and, and right now with the Biden EPA, they are working on ways to use conventional air, re regulation of conventional air pollutants as the back doorway of regulating climate. So this is something that people should pay attention to. We've got, there's actually a lawsuit right now in federal court. The case is called Young v. EPA. It's in a district court for a district for Washington, D.C., and it alleges that EPA has basically rigged the peer review process oh. that is, uh, is required to undergo by law for air quality. And if, if the plaintiff in that case, Stan Young, wins, that will set EPA back and do a great deal of damage to the Biden administration's effort to use air quality as a backdoor way of regulating climate. What do you think are the most effective ways for just ordinary people like me, maybe, to fight back against the climate scam? For people that are on Twitter and social media, what do you think? I think that social media is a great way. I spend a lot of my time on Twitter, as you do, mm -hmm. and we need to take the information that we find on Twitter and other places, and we need to keep circulating it. I say the same thing a lot of the time. And it's because you have to. You can't just say things once because yeah. they get lost. You have a different audience yeah. every day. Yeah. And even for people that have heard it, they need to hear it multiple times because it, it just it doesn't take the, the, just once for a lot of people. And I, I, I apologize to anyone of you who is like, oh, my God, this again. Well, <laughs> you have to know it. And you, and you have to be able to regurgitate it pretty easily. And... You have to know that almost all the stuff that you, all, all these scare stories you read in the media can be de debunked pretty easily. Yeah. You just have to, mm -hmm. you just have to try. I mean, it doesn't, you have to try very hard. Uh, like this Pakistan, you know, we talked about this Pakistan flood. Yeah. Look, look at, read all the articles today. See all the headlines. And of course, that's, that's, most people will just read the headlines and not even read the article. Well, I actually read the New York Times article. I, I think it was the New York Times article where they you have this Indian scientist who talks about this study that shows that precipitation has been actually declining in India and, and Pakistan, that region, for the last 50 years. Well, that, that doesn't fit the climate narrative that the warming atmosphere is holding more water, and that's what's right. causing mm -hmm. more rain. So, so, so the least people could do is repeat the stuff I saw. I like the idea of pushing back, even 
my hometown paper is the Star Tribune here in Minnesota. It's a very uh, liberal area, but a lot of times there'll be tons of people pushing back against the climate cultism in yeah. the paper in the comment section. I love to see that. That's fun. That's great. But whatever social media you're on, I, I just, I encourage all everyone to do this because it, it's what they do. Mm -hmm. It's what they do. And there's a lot of people that, <clears throat> excuse me, are concerned about these issues, confused about these issues. If, if we don't respond and even maybe take the offensive, then we're, we're, we're just seeding ground unnecessarily. I mean, I have never run into a bigger group of liars than climate. I mean, it is just, it's incredible. It, just everything they say is, is readily debunkable. I can't let them get away with it. I, I, it's, I, I didn't plan on spending my life this way, but I mean, these people are, this is just outrageous what's going on and we, we can't allow them to win. Okay. And do you enjoy pushing back? Because I've heard Tony Heller say on multiple podcasts that he really loves it. I, I actually really love it. Do you, do you take well, some joy in it? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of perverse. I mean, yeah, I enjoyed being able to yeah. push back against it. And I enjoyed seeing that, mm -hmm. that they're not right. On the other hand, it's, it's very frustrating. Who would imagine that we would be spending so much time doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible. I mean, and I, I do this full time and Tony does it full time. Yeah. I guess what's kind of cool about it is there really just is a handful of us that have been doing this for right, right. a very long time mm -hmm. and had pretty good success. Because we have every institution in the world against us, everyone, right? Government, yeah. schools, universities, yeah. big corporations, nonprofit. I mean, everybody has bought into the climate scam, yet it's very difficult for them to make any progress. I mean, they basically have to shove it down your throat. And then when you poll people, is climate a priority? The answer is no. How much are you going to, how much would you be willing to pay for it? Nothing. So, yeah. so these are all victories of a sort, but then you run into this. Inflation Reduction Act, $369 billion wasted. Mm -hmm. It's sad, but I guess I'm going to have fun the next 10 years exposing the fraud. It was kind of interesting when gas prices went up and Biden said that it was the patriotic duty of refiners to refine more fossil fuel. I mean, he just flipped 180 instantly as soon as it was politically untenable to, because <laughs> nobody wants high gas prices when they're appealing to voters, I, I don't think, do they? Yeah. No. yeah. Well, look, I think the, the thing you have to remember with Biden is just disregard whatever he says, because he's always lying. Whether he knows it or not, why he's doing it, I don't know. But the, the bottom line is his policies are extremely anti-fossil fuel. There's nothing he is doing to lower gas prices. Everything he is doing is only going to make gas more expensive. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a single thing he's done to reduce gas prices. I know he likes to take credit for that. Yeah. If there has been a slight drop in gas prices, it's because gas prices are so high, people have just cut back. And that reduction in demand has reduced prices. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Do you think there's any chance that American LNG will help out Europe this year or next year? I don't understand if we have enough ability to ship enough over there to make a difference. Well, since, since the Biden administration is trying to reduce production here, <clears throat> it doesn't yeah. really make sense to me yeah. to ship it to Europe. Okay. Got to keep it here. I, I think Europe has plenty of fracking potential. I don't know if it's as great as the United States, but it's certainly a lot. They have decided not to frack, and that's because Putin has been paying environmental groups to campaign in Europe, so none of it happens. No, I, I, I'm not for sending LNG. I mean, I own stock in LNG companies and, and I want them to export, but, and, and that would be okay if, if we were just going to green light all fossil fuel production and not tell coal plants or not, not tell utilities that they can't burn coal, they have to burn natural gas. I mean, the problem with this anti-coal policy, utilities are trying to switch in or have been switching into gas for a long time now. So now we're seeing the problem with that. We are overly dependent on gas. So if there's an energy crisis in Europe, well, of course, that's going to come here, raise gas prices here, and we've shut down coal plants, so we can't just start burning more coal. Uh, our energy economy was a lot healthier when we could balance coal against natural gas, and they were sort of a check on each other. But mm -hmm. if we're just going to get rid of coal, yeah. I mean, it's just re relying on one fuel is not smart, and Europe is fighting that now in a painful way. 
Okay. But the U.S. has huge supplies of unburned coal, right, that we could turn to at some point. Oh, yeah. I think we have hundreds of years worth. Yeah, we have hundreds of years worth of coal and basically an infinite supply of natural gas. Okay. We got plenty of fossil fuels. And then, yeah, we throw in, we, we, we can use nuclear power, right? It can, it can be used safely. We've got plenty of uranium. Energy, energy and water are the two most abundant things on Earth. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you can't get water and you can't get energy, it's because there's some green or some politician in your way. Uh, okay. We have the technology to use these things and supply everybody with everything they need, but, you know, government gets in the way of that. Do you think we're going to be successful in getting new nuclear plants built in the U.S. in the next 10 years? Not in the next 10 years. No? Uh, no, I mean, I think I think there's a couple couple of nuclear projects going on places where people are thinking about it, but large-scale nuclear plants. I don't really see that happening. I think it'd be politically impossible to get that stuff adopted on a, on a large scale. So, but, but we have, look, we have plenty of energy. We have plenty of water. If you can't get it, it's because government's getting in the way. What is the biggest hang up though, politically for the nuclear power plants? Just the danger, there's going to be another Chernobyl. Is that the reason why? Yeah, I think, probably- you know, the, the, the nuclear power industry, they, they have, they have pretty cool technology. I mean, it's, uh, imagine splitting the atom, yeah. powering the world. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, but the nuclear management has got to be the stupidest corporate management I've ever run across because they have done almost nothing to defend themselves against mm-hmm. the <clears throat> tremendously exaggerated risks of radiation. And instead, they have embraced global warming, hoping that that is going to lead to their renaissance. Well, you know, even if, even if global warming it takes a firmer hold than it has now, nuclear is not coming back because people are afraid of radiation and Chernobyl, three, of course, Three Mile Island in the U.S., no one was really hurt. Mm-hmm. Chernobyl was a disaster, but of course, because it, had, it, was, it was designed, built by Russians and they built junk. Fukushima, that was an avoidable catastrophe, but no one died from the radiation. People mm-hmm. died from the uh, evacuation, but yeah. no one died from the radiation there. I've got a friend, Ed Calabrese at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Ed has done this wonderful expose about how the dangers of radiation have, I, I don't want to just say exaggerated, but lied about. Okay. His work is not funded by the nuclear power industry. He's kind of like us. He's got a, we have a bug about climate. You've got a bug about radiation. He's done excellent work. So there's no reason we couldn't have a nuclear renaissance in this country, but we won't because I don't think the managements really understand how, how safe nuclear power is. Okay. All right. And maybe a related question is, why aren't the fossil fuel companies in the U.S. pushing back harder against the climate scam? Well, that's a good question. And I don't really have a very good answer for you. There is, let's talk about ExxonMobil because they're the ones that, you know, are in the, cross, in the crosshair. So ExxonMobil was pushing back until the mid-2000s. And then they got a new CEO, Rex Tillerson. Oh, okay. And he immediately capitulated and decided to go green and, and decided to support international climate treaties and carbon taxes, all the while increasing production. And I, I file shareholder proposals with Exxon every year. So I talk with management every year. And I, I based on the words that come out of their mouth, I mean, they seem to be true believers okay, they do. in climate. Okay. Really? Yet at the same time, the Exxon CEO, in response to the work I've been doing says, well, we're just, we're going to pump all the oil we can and sell all the oil we can to meet consumer demand. Okay. So, and then we got this whole ESG phenomenon. ESG is the environmental social governance standards that, you know, Michael Bloomberg and banks and investment managers are trying to impose on companies like Exxon. So why are, why are they not pushing back? I hate to say just because they're stupid, but they seem to be. Okay. That was what I was afraid of. Okay. Do you plan to head down to the Heartland Climate Conference in February? Any plans yet? I will. I will be there for sure. I plan I'm, on the board, I'm on the board of Heartland, and okay. you know, maybe I'll get to speak too. Okay. Oh, fantastic. All right. And you are on Heartland the podcast, right? In the tank. Okay. Happy okay. to do it. Okay. All right. Where else can we look for your stuff? On JunkScience.com and on Twitter, right? Yeah. I mean, I have, I have junk science, but I spend most of my time on Twitter just because it's superior technology for getting the word out. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of people on Twitter and you can always tweak the, the media on Twitter. I think 
I, I enjoy getting blocked okay. by people that can't defend themselves against what I say about them. So, I mean, that, to me, that's a victory. Last, last week, it was Washington Post meteorologist Matthew Capucci. Um, we've had, we've, we've had a fair back and forth on a lot of his climate stuff. And he just, he can't handle it anymore. He can't defend himself. He can't handle it. So he's blocked me. So, but I think that it's a badge of honor. I mean, I've got a lot of Washington Post, New York Times. I even find that I will read a story where a scientist is quoted and I will go on Twitter to see if I can find the scientist so I can tag him or whatever. And I find I've already been blocked. It never hurt the guy. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah. That's oh, wow. really cool. A preemptive block. Do you have any more books uh, that you're planning to write? I don't know. Maybe one day. I mean, everything is, look, everything is online now. People are on their phone. I mean, who, yeah. reads, who reads books? Mm -hmm. uh, if you write a book, there's a lot of people that listen to books. They listen to audio books, which is what I do. And my last book, I sort of self-published because it was just easier to do and to get it out quicker. But of course, I can't afford a reader to have it read and distributed that way. I, I'm going to be on Twitter because it's, it's the best way to communicate. You reach the most, most number of people. Maybe one day I'll write a book. I mean, I've got a lot of ideas, but writing a book is a lot of work. I mean, it's a real, it's a real commitment and it yeah. takes away from everything else you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you're not doing anything else, you can write a book, but if you're doing stuff, it's hard to write a book. Okay. Is it, is Green Hell, is that your most recent? My most recent book is Scare Pollution. Okay. Uh, which is available on Amazon. And it, it, it talks about this air quality PM 2.5 particulate matter scam, you know, $600 million EPA scam that okay. was used to destroy the coal industry during the Obama administration. Okay. And it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good expose of just the scientific corruption at EPA. I really appreciate your time. And if you could come back again, I would love that. Totally love it. Yeah. Anytime, Tom. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. I think we're done. All right. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Yep, bye.